morning, church and visitors. For those who don't know me, I'm Helen Moscar, and I want to welcome you to the Greater Pittsburgh Church of Christ. It is the Christmas season, and many of us may be caught up in distraction this time of year can bring. So let's take time to get focused on why we are here this morning. Let's look at Matthew 2, starting in verse 7. Uh, then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go too and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure and presented with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Uh, we see that here they were overjoyed on coming to the house. Let us put aside our distraction and give God the glory. It said they bowed low. Let us put God above ourselves this morning. It says they worship him. One of our greatest acts of worship to God is directing all our hearts to him. Uh, Herod like Satan, had a different motive for finding Jesus. Satan does not want us to worship Jesus. Just as God directed the wise man, he can direct us today. And at this time, my sister in Christ, Miss Karen, is going to prepare our hearts for communion. Thank you. Good morning, family. My name is Miss Karen, as Helen said. We're part of the Mature Ministry, and I would like to lead you to the cross this morning. I'm going to be reading from Isaiah 9, verse 6. Um, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Peace, Prince of Peace. When I was a child, or even a young kid in school, the story of the birth of Jesus was told to me and my classmates over the PA system in school. It was always followed by singing Away in the Manger. This event always pumped me up for all the good stuff the holiday would bring. Food, gifts, family, food, gifts, and family, I'm sorry. As I got older, the story of the birth of Jesus meant gifts to give and to receive. When I became a disciple, I realized the gift was Jesus himself. Born of a virgin, sent to earth to save us all by dying on a cross. This was more than a story. This was real life. I have received the forgiveness of sin and life eternal. This gift surpasses any gift I could have received. As we take communion today, Remember that Jesus is indeed the reason for the season. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, as we come to you this morning, we come to you in thanks. Thankful hearts, thankful minds, and thankful environment that you gave us your son. You gave us the best gift we could ever ask for. During this time of giving and receiving, Lord, I pray that we would remember the gift that you gave us, everlasting life and forgiveness of sins. As we take this communion this morning, Lord, I pray that we focus on not just the holiday and all the festivities, Lord, but the sacrifice of your child that you gave to us to bring us totally and completely surrender to you. I pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Hark, 
Christmas. From the Rosenquist family to yours, we hope that you're having a fantastic Christmas season and enjoying yourselves uh, this Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, day after Christmas, whenever you're watching this. Hope that you and your family or whoever you're spending Christmas with, that you're enjoying yourself and uh, taking time to remember Jesus and his birth and this time together as a family, as a community, we can collectively remember that Jesus was born for us to bring us hope and transformation. You know, Christmas time is full of so many different traditions. Some families, they open a present early on Christmas Eve. Some go out to a, a special restaurant or have a special meal that they enjoy together. Some go out and, and serve in the community or volunteer in some way. Some go caroling. Some have a special game that they play. But almost every tradition or family tradition probably involves, you know, one Christmas movie. Maybe it's several Christmas movies, but probably each family, or, you have that one Christmas movie that you're like, yes. This is my movie. This is the one. It's not Christmas until I watch this movie or until I watch these 20 movies, whatever it might be. But Christmas is a time where we, we watch some great movies. And what's cool is I was thinking about it this year. A lot of those movies have to do with transformation. A lot of them tell a story of some kind of transformation. I'll give you a few examples, you know, from the classics. You have Scrooge. You know, Scrooge is, is uh, bitter and angry and upset and tight-fisted. And yet his whole demeanor on life changes. He becomes a generous and kind man wanting to go and, and help old Tiny Tim and help, help the world and the community around him. He completely changes in a, in a Christmas carol. Then, of course, the Grinch. You know, his heart is, is too small and his heart grows three times its size. He goes, oh, the humanity! 
you. And he's, he's a changed Grinch um, by the end of that story. And of course, It's a Wonderful Life, my favorite Christmas movie. You know, with George Bailey, he's, he's ready to give up on life. He thinks things would be better if he weren't alive. But he, he's given a, a new perspective that it truly is a wonderful life. And he sees uh, the love and generosity of those around him and that he's been used in many ways, even though he didn't see it. His whole outlook changes. He goes, I want to live, Clarence. I want to live. Zozo's pedals. And he's just, he's a different guy. George Bailey changes and it's a wonderful life. Then you got uh, the Santa Claus. Tim Allen goes from a regular dude to, to Santa Claus. Talk about transformation there. The movie Elf, you have his dad, Walter Hobbs, who's very kind of Scrooge-like and, and he doesn't want to give the orphanage books and he's, he's a, an angry guy. He's got some bitterness going on, but his heart changes and he begins to believe and spread Christmas cheer by the end of that movie. I'm, I'm ruining all these movies, but hopefully you've seen them before. Then of course, Die Hard, you know, John McClane and Holly Gennaro, they're their marriage is on the rocks, but by the end of the movie, their marriage has been restored. They're back together, driving off in the limousine as the snow um, or debris is falling from the from the sky. And then Rudolph, remember that? The, the claymation movie. It's hard to find these days. I think you can find it on YouTube somewhere. But uh, love love that movie. And the, the abominable snowman, he changes. He's angry and upset. And uh, Cornelius at the end comes in and says, I reformed this bumble. And he comes in and he, he has a special job. He was the angry bad guy villain of the story. And now he's putting the star on the top of the tree. And all these Christmas stories have to do with transformation. And Home Alone, the mom and dad, they leave their son. And by the end, well, I think Home Alone 2, they leave him again. So maybe, maybe they don't change. But for most Christmas movies, it involves some kind of, of transformation, which can be really powerful. And I think we're drawn to these stories of transformations. But as Christians, Christmas, not just because of the movies, but Christmas, the actual Christmas story, the nativity, the, the birth of Jesus, this is a story of transformation, that Jesus changes everything. The transformative work of, of Jesus coming to us as a Savior offers us redemption, a new start, and brings us hope. Christmas is a time of transformation because Jesus changes everything. Today we're going to read the Song of Mary from Luke chapter 1. For the month we've been talking about this theme of sing a new song to the Lord, that maybe some of our routines are beginning to become ruts and we can feel stuck and in this place of complaining or this place of irritation or faithlessness. And the point is to not stay there, to acknowledge where we are, to let that song play out, but then to sing a new song. And uh, we started with Joshua, but then we looked at the the story of Jesus' birth and looked at several songs that were going on. Zechariah changes his tune from doubt to hope and praise. Uh, the angels, you know, their, their song speaks of a, a new birth coming in, a new time of, of God's favor coming in on the earth. And then today we're going to look at Mary's song, not the Mary Did You Know song, although that's a good song too, but, but the song that Mary sings in Luke chapter 1. So let's start off by reading this together in Luke chapter 1. All right, this is after Mary has interacted with Elizabeth, who's carrying um, uh, John the Baptist. And we talked about that story a little bit a few weeks ago. But uh, she is, it's basically confirmed. Um, Elizabeth says this to her. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. So there's some extra um, kind of proof that, Mary, this is, you, you, are, you are going to birth the Savior of the world. And this is Mary's response in verse 46. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their th uh, thrones and lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Man, I love this This. Joy, this song that uh, 
that Mary sings. It's a song of acceptance of the task that lies before her and joy at being chosen by God. She seems to highlight the gift of transformation found in her uh, um, housing Jesus and then birthing Jesus. She recognizes that she is lowly. She probably had poor status. She, she talks about um, being poor or being uh, humble. She describes herself as being in a humble state. This isn't her bragging about being humble, but it's her talking about her state. It's of humble means that she's, she's lowly. She is low. But then she says, but from now on, generations will call me blessed. That I was low, I was, I was in a humble state, but I'm going to be lifted up by my God. Jesus changes everything. She's lowly, but God makes her great. From now on, generations will call her blessed. And we do. We see Mary everywhere this time of year. We honor Mary because of, of what she did, because of her faith and her faithful servitude to the calling of God. And then it talks about in Jesus, what, what Jesus is meant to bring about in his ministry, the hungry will be filled up, the lowly will be blessed, the insignificant will gain significance, and the lost will be found. Jesus brings transformation. Not only do we see this in the Song of Mary that we just read, but Jesus describes his ministry a little bit later in Luke chapter 4. And he quotes a, a scripture from Isaiah as his thesis statement of what he plans to do in his time here on earth. This is what it says in Luke 4 verse 18. This is Jesus talking to uh, the, the religious leaders of the day. He says, The Spirit is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Again, to bring about transformation. That the poor who don't normally have good news have reason for hope and good news. That those who are prisoners get freedom. For those that are blind receive sight and the oppressed will be set free. Jesus came to bring transformation. We see this in his ministry and at his birth. His purpose is to transform. Even the song, the other Mary song that we like to sing, you know, in the bridge it highlights this. Mary, did you know? The blind will see. The deaf will speak. The dead will live again. The lame will leap. The dumb will speak. The praises of the Lamb. There's this, man, the, the leaping, uh, leaping cripples and, and um, people who can't speak begin to speak and people who are deaf um, will hear again. And there's this image of, wow, this is amazing. Jesus brings about transformation. Not only did he do these in his ministry, but from the very beginning, not just in his birth, but the very, very beginning, he has been associated with transformation. In John chapter 1, Jesus is described as the word of God becoming flesh. And that's specific language. In fact, John chapter 1 verse 1 starts with, in the beginning uh, was the word. And so there's, there's language tying that back all the way to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so Jesus is described as the Word of God. But if you go back to Genesis and you look at creation, how did God create? What was the beginning? He uses words. And he says, let there be light. And the world is forever transformed as a result. That the Word of God, a.k.a. Jesus, from the very beginning of creation, has had transformative powers, has meant and had the purpose to transform those that interact with the Word of God. Jesus changes everything. The question this morning, this afternoon, this evening is this. Is He changing you? His very purpose is to change anything that interacts with Him, to bring about total transformation. But is that purpose being lived out in your life? Is he changing you? We cannot genuinely interact with Jesus and the words of God without being changed, without being transformed. That's his purpose. And sometimes we forget that that's the purpose of God's word, that that's the purpose of Jesus is to bring about change. It's easy to get offended at the insinuation in a sermon or a conversation or just reading the Bible that you should change, you should grow, you should transform. You know, I, I can have goals for myself and think, man, I should really work on this. But as soon as someone else tells me, yeah, you need to change, I'm like, hold up, 
excuse me? Who are you to tell me I need to change? We get upset about that insinuation of needing to change or transform. But that's the very purpose of Jesus. Jesus changes everything. You know, when we uh, hear this call to change, it's easy to say, well, I'm going through something. Or, man, it's really challenging to change. Or, I had the wrong motivation for changing in the past, and I want to get the right motivation now. All of that is true, and God is patient, and his love for us is not contingent on our transformation, but that doesn't change his purpose. That his purpose is to change us, to transform us. So sometimes those excuses uh, that are very real, instead of being something that we deal with, well, I got to get the right motivation. I got to work on my heart. I got to be willing to, to, to look internally and change. We just kind of stay the same. And therefore, the very work of the Holy Spirit or the work of Jesus that's meant to transform our life um, doesn't have the effect that it's meant to have, right? And that's, that's on us to make sure that Jesus is, is fulfilling his purpose in our lives, that we're allowing him and his words to change us. Coming into contact with Jesus and his words is designed to transform us. We need to change, and that's not offensive. That's life-giving. You need to change. I need to change. We need to change, <laughs> And what a, a blessing that reality is. The call to transform is in alignment with the will of God, seen clearly on display in the message of transformation found at Christmas time. How incredible is it to consider how he has already transformed us, helped us grow and change? For so many of us, Jesus has changed everything. Think about the transformation that Jesus has already brought to your life. You know, this is. Going into New Year's, it's a time where we do some self-reflection. Man, when I think about where I would be in my life right now without Jesus, without uh, other Christians helping me in my journey, without the Word of God, without the transformative grace found through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, ugh, that is a, a scary thought. That's the nightmare before Christmas. I don't want to think about that um, because it's, I don't like who I would be without Jesus. And the, the fear that would that would uh, define my life, that would punctuate so many moments of my life, the fear I would live in, the, the false sense of self that I would put out into the world, the lying and deceit that would define so much of my interactions. I'd be so filled with bitterness without the call to forgive and the power of the Holy Spirit to help me forgive. And I would be so self-absorbed. I'm self-absorbed as a Christian and selfish as a Christian. How much more so without the transformative work of Jesus in my life? Would I be obsessed or absorbed with myself? And praise God that we have experienced his transformative powers. And I, and I pray that if you're watching this, that you have experienced the, the renewal of the Holy Spirit through repentance and baptism, that, that you've been changed by the word of God. But the transformation that we're meant to experience in Jesus is not simply when we first become Christians or when we first interact with the gospel message. But it's meant to be a regular, ongoing thing. It's not a one-time transformation, but we're continually transformed by Jesus and by his word. We are meant to be continually changed to be more like Jesus so that we can bring greater transformation to the world around us. So how can we do that? We're going to close with John chapter 15. Words of Jesus reminding us how we can actually be transformed. And then in doing so, transform the world around us. Jesus says in John 15, Remain in me and my words. Remain in me and you will bear much fruit. He gives this promise. He goes, apart from me, you can't do it. You can do nothing apart from me. But I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. So how can we be transformed? And by the way, bearing fruit is like ultimate transformation, right? To go from a leaf or a flower and be transformed into a fruit that goes and falls to the ground and plants another tree and has impact um, for centuries. Man, that kind of transformation happens simply by remaining connected to the vine. And the vine in this case is Jesus. So how do we transform? Well, it's not I got to work on myself in a 10-step program and I got to do this. Although it's great to have a plan and great to, to enact different things in your life. But change begins with the surrender, the, um, the conviction to remain in Jesus, the resolve to say, I'm going to remain in him. Christmas time is so fun, but it's easy to do all the stuff and not take the time to remain in him, 
It's easy to plan for 2023 to think about all that you're going to do and to not think and, and pause for a second to consider how in 2023 can I remain in Jesus and continually experience his transformative power in my life. You know, there's a, uh, a coffee company that I, I respect greatly. It's called Redeeming Grounds. And uh, what they've done is uh, maybe 20 years ago, uh, they started to uh, convince farmers in Colombia uh, that were coca uh, plant farmers that would basically uh, fuel the cocaine industry coming out of Colombia and fuel drug lords and different things like that. They would convince these farmers who weren't making much money off of coca plant to say, okay, Instead of selling your coffee grounds or your coffee, grow coffee instead, and instead of selling that to the government where you're not going to make much money, we'll buy it at a higher price. Price you'll make more money, and you're going to make some enemies. But your fields and all your farming work won't go to to hurt those around you to to fuel the 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 drug empire that that's that surrounds you. But instead, you'll you'll create coffee, which can can be life giving in a lot of ways but uh, that you'll produce something that they can bring great, greater things to the world around you and help transform your community. And so over time, all these farmers would sign on and they started um, basically burning down their coca fields and then instead planting coffee. And coffee would start to grow and it's this uh, amazing picture of transformation, uh, not only of the community, but of the economy and of the actual uh, product that was being grown in these fields. What I love most about it, to be honest, besides the story, is, is the name of the coffee company. It's called Redeeming Grounds. And I love that, that name because the ground, the very ground that had a purpose that was uh, malicious, a purpose that was not helpful, not beneficial, now has a greater purpose to bring life, right? To, to, to do something uh, powerful and effective and to do, do some good. And so the very ground gets redeemed or bought back for a greater purpose. And I love that story because that's what Jesus has done for us. That through his birth, through his life, through his death and his resurrection, he has redeemed us. That we had one purpose and now we have another, right? We're, we're the redeemed grounds that have greater purpose. And obviously it's a play on words, coffee grounds and the very actual ground. I'm a big fan of those kinds of things, but that's what... Jesus has done for us. He's redeemed us, changed our purpose. This Christmas, decide to remain in him. If that's something that you need to do differently, then do it. If that's something you need to just continue doing, then do that. But consider the transformation that he brings to the world and to you, and let him continually change each and every one of us. It's his purpose. It's what he came to do. In the words of joy to the world, he comes to make his blessing flow far as the curse is found. Where there are curses, instead there are blessings. Where we are humble and lowly, he brings greatness. And in him, he brings transformative power and, uh, and hope to our lives. Merry Christmas, and we'll see you next year. Merry Christmas from Pittsburgh Church and from the Rosenquist family. We love you guys. Let's pray for, uh, for uh, the rest of the day. Father God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the hope that you show us in the cross. Thank you for the hope that you give us in your birth. I pray that this Christmas season we can take time to remember, to remember you and the transformative power found in you and through you. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. Merry Christmas. this day a Savior gifted from heaven to a manger the hope of the world alive for all mankind all of the earth rejoice, it's Christmas time. So lift up your voice and sing out his praise. It's Christmas. Born is the king, rejoice in the day. It's Christmas. Oh, make a joyful sound. It's Christmas. Let his praise resound. It's Christmas. 
goodwill to all the earth and peace divine, yeah. All of the earth rejoice, it's Christmas time, it's Christmas time.